We're spending 22 minutes today with Graham Nash. <laughs> Usually I give some sort of an identifier, but didn't need to do that this time. So you're here to talk about this fantastic solo album, which I was lucky enough to get a, a CD copy of. I've been listening to it. It's, it's just great. First in 14 years. Uh, yes, it has been 14 years since my last uh, solo record, but I've been a busy boy in these last 14 years. I've been totally immersed in the music of me and David and Stephen and Neil, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, me and my friends uh, Joel Bernstein and Stanley Johnson produced 16 CDs in the last 10 years. Amazing. I did Crosby's box set and Stevens' box set and my box set and CSNY 1974 stadium tour and mm -hmm. greatest hits and demo records. I've been busy. Yeah. And we've also done, you know, over 400 shows in the last 10 years. And doing more now. You're Indeed. starting a tour, yeah. right? Absolutely, yeah. 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 I, I'm really proud of this record. My friend Shane Fontaine, who is the second electric guitar player in the Crosby, Stills and Nash band, uh, produced this record for me and uh, wrote all the songs with me too. And the song, the title track, This Path Tonight, very kind of introspective, fair to say? I would say that was a fair thing to say, introspective, mm -hmm. and yet here I am on the cover walking in this snowstorm in Woodstock, which was the first time I'd ever been to a, actually Woodstock, you know, because <laughs> of course the... Uh, Not the farm. Well, the festival wasn't there, it was... <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm on the cover here, I'm walking to my future, and it, it looks bright to me. I know I'm walking through a snowstorm, but that's the way life is sometimes, isn't it? And then some songs, uh, sounds like about lost love and about looking for love. Another Absolutely. Broken Heart and Target, also gorgeous songs. What were you, th what were you thinking of? What was the process in writing Here's those? Here's basically what's going on. I, my life is a little, my personal life is a little chaotic right now. Uh, I... A couple of years ago, my, my wife and I decided that we would get divorced. Uh, so that process has been going on for a couple of years. I don't know where anybody here has been through. It's not an easy process, as, obviously. Um, and in the meantime, I fell in love with this beautiful New York lady artist here in, uh, in, in New York City who set me back on fire. And uh, these songs are just my... Um, my emotional journey that I'm going through in my life. And, I'm, you know... As usual, you know, as a songwriter, I, I, I think that there's probably a lot of people out there going through the same thing. Mm -hmm. And this is how I'm dealing with it. And maybe it could be helpful to people. Yeah. And the, the, the final track, uh, Encore, really touching. I mean, a beautiful bookend uh, for this CD. But also talking about what, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, obviously, what happens when the last show is over. Yeah, who are you? Yeah. When the last song is sung, who are you? You know, when you don't have all the trappings of stardom. Mm -hmm. You know, who are you when the last show is done? Are you a good person? Do you want to add to the universe or do you want to take away? I personally, um, I like adding things. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a, a great believer in karma and uh, good deeds. Trying to have the best time you can in a, a very short life. I'm 74 years old right now and it's like, you know, to have changed my life so profoundly uh, is, you know, I don't know whether I'm the most stupid person on earth or the smartest. <laughs> you mention um, some of the themes in your album, and I think part of the appeal of your music over the years is its universality, in, in the specific yet. And I, I think of the song that you wrote uh, with when Joni Mitchell was your muse, Our House. Can you tell us how you wrote that? Yeah, I, I've said this a lot. I don't know any musician that knows when the muse of music is going to come visit, you know. <laughs> um, so you have to be open all the time. And sometimes songs come from the most ordinary places. And, and the, what Bridget just said about our house is a perfect example. I, I, uh, uh, I took Joni, my girlfriend Joni Mitchell to breakfast one day at a delicatessen in the valley in Los Angeles. And... Uh, after breakfast, walking back to her car, uh, we passed an antique store and she looked in the window and she saw a nice vase that she wanted to buy. It was pretty cheap, it was less than $100, so she bought it and we got back to her house in Laurel Canyon and I said, hey, wait a second, why don't I light a fire and you put some flowers in that vase that you just bought today? <laughs> but some people buy a vase and go home and they, they can't write a song about it. How does, how does somebody do that? 
Um, because it was an incredibly <laughs> ordinary moment between two people that were deeply in love with each other. Uh, it was an ordinary moment. You know, she just bought a vase in a window and, and you know, it's like, you know. And the one thing about, about it that was so great is that because she had to go outside to get some flowers for the vase, she wasn't at her piano, which meant, of course, that I was. And, and our house was probably written within an hour and a half of that moment. Do you talk to her? There have been reports about her health failing. Are, are you in touch with her at all? Of course. Yeah. And how is yeah. she? Um, Joni's doing very well, as a matter of fact. She, uh, she was in a coma for a long time. Uh, she came out of the coma and, and, and she's speaking and, and, and clearly and, uh, and her thoughts are uh, exactly as they should be. And as a matter of fact, the other day she called for paints. So anyone that wants to paint pictures can't, can't be too far out of the picture, you know. Uh, so Joni's doing good. She, it, it'll, it'll probably take a little longer to get her back to being fully, can't say this with Joni, but normal. Um, uh, I think she's going to do fine. It, like I said, it's going to take a little longer than we thought, but yeah. Let's talk about the tour that you're, you're leaving, uh, I guess, for overseas soon. But first, you're playing at, uh, in Brooklyn, Hudson Hudson Union Society, right? Yeah, that, Before you, yeah. And then, and that, then you take off for Brooklyn? Uh, then you take off for Europe and then back home? Um, actually, no. I take off for Los Angeles. I've got a okay. few things to do there. And then I come back to New York and then we go to Europe, yes. Okay. When, when I say home, I mean New York home, not, not, yes. not, not your original well, you know, home. I'm not used to calling New York home. I've never lived here. Uh, I've been many times, of course, and it was always like, I can take it for a week or 10 days and I gotta get out of here, it's too crazy. <laughs> you see, I, I lived for 40 years in the jungle in Hawaii, you know, and, and, mm. and, and it seems that I just traded jungles. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of jungles, we mentioned Woodstock and, or, or Matt, Matt Yasker's farm to be, to be precise. Um, you guys played there. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what that was like and how that compares with the current tour that you're on, just the, the craziness of those days versus touring well, nowadays. Know, it's still crazy out there. Um, Woodstock was only the second time that we'd ever played music in front of people. Second show only, uh, which was quite amazing, really. Uh, lots of mud, lots of rain, lots of dope, <laughs> lots of people. You know, Woodstock. Uh, and, but the difference nowadays, and I'm kind of enjoying this, is that I'm, I'm playing smaller, beautiful theaters, and I can see my audience, and I can look in their eyes and know if I'm making contact. And it's very different than trying to sing Guinevere with one acoustic guitar and two voices and a half a million people. Right. Slightly yeah. different, but it's very enjoyable. And the mud and, and, and drugs and, 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 yes. and everything else. Um, now, you've made some appearances here in New York, not necessarily Attica. Did you wind up at the Sanders rally last night? There was some talk that you were going to be there. I was going to be there. We were in negotiations all day. And unfortunately, the Sanders campaign, I think, slipped up a little because they, they didn't ask the New York police for a music license. Oh, you, oh, was that what it was? OK. Yes. Ah. For a certain amount of music. Anyway. But my point is that I, I, I've lived here for almost 50 years, and I've never seen the political climate so strange. This looks like a clown car to me. Uh, <laughs> when you think about the small chance that Trump or Ted Cruz could be the president of the United States, it should scare the shit out of everybody. <laughs> um, I think both of them have terrible, terrible ideas, divisive and providing, you know, the, the, their audience with an enemy and, and stoking up their fears. Uh, and on the other side, we have uh, Hillary and Bernie. And I think that Hillary would be a good president for the present system. Mm -hmm. But as Bernie so often says, the present system is broken. Mm -hmm. And I think that Bernie Sanders would be a better president for the system that I feel is coming. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, what is Bernie now, 74? I mean, he, 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 I, I, I think he wanted to start a political revolution rather than be president. Mm -hmm. I think the seeking the presidency is on this path, but I think he really wants to start a political revolution that will end up eventually with, you know, the, uh, the income inequality problem being sorted out and getting money out of politics and getting rid of Citizens United, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, bringing younger people into the, into the system because all the 
laws that the politicians are making on their behalf affect their very lives and they should know that and they should they should get involved uh, uh, deeper into politics I think Bernie's idea of the trade agreements shipping American jobs overseas to a cheaper place uh, uh, is, is a good strong point I think that Bernie Sanders would make a great president over the years um, you have gotten political in, in your music and your lyrics um, in concert No Nukes with Jackson Brown back in, in 79. And also um, one of your more famous songs, I would say, Teach Your Children, that was a song with a message, right? Was that, that was inspired by a photograph, wasn't it? I had started the idea of, of, of Teach Your Children when I was uh, in my final days with the Hollies. Uh, but I, I used to, um, I used to, I, I had a huge collection of, of classic photography images, and I would put uh, put them on, on on view occasionally. And there was, I've never, uh, whenever I've shown my photographs, I've never told the gallery owner how to hang them. You know, uh, they know their space much better than I do. You know. But I'm curious always as to which picture they put next to which picture because, to me, pictures talk to each other. Mm -hmm. When you when human beings leave and turn the light on, the images talk and go, "Hey, well, how about that woman <laughs> with the funny purple hat?" You know, <laughs> um, and and they talk to each other, so they have to be compatible. Mm -hmm. And one day, uh, I had given my uh, my collection to the Desaise Museum in, in in California for an exhibit, and the the uh, curator there had put together one of the very first pictures I ever owned, which was taken by a woman called Diane Arbus of a boy in Central Park with a hand grenade. Uh, that was one of the first images that I bought in the early, uh, early 70s. And that was right next to an Arnold Newman portrait of Krupp, who was uh, the, uh, the German uh, arms manufacturer's family, you know, that made all the weapons for World War I and World War II for Germany. And when, when I saw these two pictures together, I really realized that if we didn't teach our kids a better way of dealing with ourselves and our fellow human beings, that humanity itself was in trouble. Mm -hmm. And I was astounded to hear uh, a year ago that um, Stephen Hawking, you know, the professor, uh, you know, at Oxford University, one of the most brilliant minds in the world, when asked um, how long he thought the human race would last, kind of, thought about it for a minute and then in that funny little machine voice that he had said maybe a thousand years that's it huh well yeah i've been a, i've been alive almost 10 percent of that <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean you know that's not a very long time you mentioned photography and um if any of you folks have not read this book you have to read it uh graham nash wild tales it's in paperback now um a fantastic read the great thing about it is you're very forthcoming in this book. You don't hold anything back. Oh, yes, I did. Did you? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you can tell us here today <laughs> anything oh. you left out. Um, actually, one thing that's not in the book, I mean, there is a, a ton in the book about your relationship with David Crosby. You describe him as this gregarious, charismatic figure. A recent interview, you said you're done with the guy. Is that still true? Yes. It is. Uh -huh. Haven't changed. What did he do? Can you tell I'm us? I'm not telling you. But it's me. And if I'm this upset, something went on. And you said you just want to focus on yourself right now. You don't want to make music with Well, with like them. I said earlier, I, 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 I've been involved in our music for so long. It seems, you know, and it's all necessary, of course, and I'm very proud of the work that we've done, but enough already, you know. I, I really, um, you know, going through these personal changes in my life, I need to concentrate on me. And, I'm, I, you know, it sounds like I'm being selfish, but I'm not, because for the last 14 years, I've been totally immersed in our music. Mm. I just need a break. And if you read the book, you will definitely get a good taste of all all the ups and downs over the year. I mean, oh, yeah. the, the wild tales and a, and a wild ride. It's a wild been a rock ride. and roll life, as it says on the cover. Yeah. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about um, Stephen Stills' underrated guitarist and you said he is up there with the the, the tippity top there is nobody like Stephen Stills on guitar mm. and I think one of the people that realizes that most of all is Neil right. you know because one of the very you know one of the very first times I ever met Neil we were about to invite him into our band and I'd never met him 
I mean, I knew he was a great writer and a great singer with the Buffalo Springfield, but I'd never met Neil. And I thought, look, if I'm going to, you know, if we're going to invite him into this band of CSN, I need to meet him, right? Mm -hmm. And so I went to breakfast on Bleecker Street with Neil, and I would have made him king of the world after that. <laughs> He Why? Was, well, because he was very funny, he was very self-assured, he knew exactly what he wanted. And at the end of the breakfast I said, so tell me, why the hell should we invite you into this band? Tell me honestly. And he thought for a moment and he said, you ever heard me and Stephen play guitar together, man? I said, okay, got it. <laughs> and he was in from that moment. They had that creative... Yeah, he, rivalry, was, he right? was obviously on yeah. fire, yeah. yes. Yeah, as you guys all were. And you made some great, you made some fantastic music, but back and forth and up and down over the years, what, what is it about rock and roll bands, the, the really great ones, that they, that they don't stay together? Or are they great because they have that dynamic well, it, where they fight? Well, I, I guess it's, it's, it's a little of both. And, and don't forget, you know, we had, as they say in England, in the cricket match, we, we had a good inning. We've been around for 47 years. You know, that, that's a lot longer than some people's lives. You know, so we, we gave it a good shot. We did make some good music in our lives, and I'm very proud of what we did. Yeah. Time to move on. Paul Simon uh, made a joke that at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I should mention you're a two-time inductee, that there should be a special wing for, for bands who who can't get along, which brings me to a great Paul Simon story that you tell in the book about how he shared an album with you mm -hmm. where there were these gorgeous harmonies. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it was 1966. The Hollies were at the Holiday Inn on West 57th Street. And uh, my phone rings in the room. I pick it up, and it's the concierge. And he says, there's a guy down here says he wants to, uh, to meet you. I said, OK, who is it? So there's that grumbling on the phone. Yeah, Oh, he says his name's Paul Simon. <laughs> so, you know, the Hollies had just done a Paul Simon song called I Am A Rock, and we made a pretty decent record of it. And, I'm, uh, you know, so Paul wanted to meet me, and I went downstairs and, you know, introduced myself to Paul, and, and Paul and Arthur kind of took me under their wing, uh, which was very kind of them. Uh, you know, they took me to recording sessions and to concerts. Um, and... I asked Paul, you know, what he was listening to lately, and he said, well, one of his favorite albums was the, called The Music of Bulgaria, which was a, an album made by the uh, National Women's uh, uh, Choir of Bulgaria. Uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight-part harmonies, you know, an unbelievable record. It's been one of my favorite records since the moment that Paul gave it to me, and also one of Crosby's favorite records, too. I think between me and David, we must have bought 500 of them and given them away because it's such an incredible album. And with all due respect, you know, the Hollies and the Birds and the Springfield and CSN and CSNY are pretty uh, well known for their harmonies, mm -hmm. but this album is something else entirely. So it was made in Paris in 1954, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, it's been one of my favorite albums ever since Paul Simon gave it to yeah. me. And I read that they once actually sang back to you that fantastic riff well, at the end of Sweet yeah, Judy, it, Blue Eyes. Yeah, that was weird. You know, I got a call. I, you know, I, I lived in Hawaii for a long time. I got a call one day from the president of Non Such Records, which is the record label that the uh, musical Bulgaria came out on in, in America. And he said that the ladies were coming over to do a small tour, and would I uh, be interested in, in coming to New York and introducing them to the press? And I've been so enamored with this record, I said, absolutely, buy me a ticket, a hotel room, I'm right there. So I came to New York from Hawaii and introduced the ladies to the press, and at the end of it, the translator came up to talk to me, and he said, Mr. Nash, the, the ladies would like to say something to you. And so I'm expecting... Thank you, Mr. Nash, for coming to New York. And you know, you know, pigeon English, right? Nah. One, two, three, four. An imperfect, like, eight part harmony. They went do, 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 do. Right to the end, man. I have a photograph of me reacting to that moment that is precious to me. How did you guys do that? That classic, classic riff at the end of the song. And, and moreover, how were you able to join the voices of, of Stills and Crosby and layer in and do that perfect three-part harmony where, as you say, you had been used to doing two-part harmony before? 
I can't tell you how I felt the first time that Stephen Stills played Sweet Judy Blue Eyes for me. First of all, I wondered who the hell he was. You know, who writes songs like that? I mean, I think, personally, I think it's a brilliant, brilliant song. And the brilliant part about it is it's actually four independent songs that were unfinished that Stephen miraculously one night put into one form. Um, and I knew that when, when we recorded Sweet Judy Blue Eyes, I, I knew that the album was going to be a hit because, I mean, quite frankly, are you going to get up and turn the record off after Sweet Judy Blue Eyes? I, I don't think so, right? You want to hear what's coming next. So we knew that it was going to be a, a big hit, that, that song. And as a matter of fact, when we were doing Deja Vu, I went to Stephen one day, we were halfway through the album, and I said, you know, we don't have Sweet Judy Blue Eyes. He said, I know, we used it on the first record. I said, no, no, we don't have that song where you're not going to take the record off after the first song. And two days later, he came to my hotel room at the Caravan Lodge Motel in San Francisco. Terribly funky place, but it was right around the corner from the studio. Um, and he said, how about this, Willie? And he'd written Carry On. Amazing, amazing. You mentioned um, a song that was generated by a bunch of different songs. Makes me think of, of the second side of, of Abbey Road mm. and The Beatles. What and a great I, record. I, yeah, I've heard you tell a great story about uh, your paths crossing with The Beatles, actually you beating The Beatles before they were The Beatles. Yes. Yes, I can actually say that. Um, <laughs> November the 19th, 1959. A man came to uh, Manchester called Carol Levis. And what he would do was he would get local talent, you know, six or seven acts, plate spinners, you know, dogs that bark, you know, Lady <laughs> of Spain, you know, those kind of shows, right? Uh, and he would, you know, at the end, he would come up and he'd put his hand above every act and who, if the audience really clapped loud for one particular act, then they won, right? So it was a, an amateur night. But on this particular night in, in, in 1959, uh, this show was very interesting because on, on it was me and Alan Clark, who later became the Hollies, uh, a man called uh, Freddie Garrity, who became Freddie and the Dreamers, a man called Ron Whiterly, who became Billy Fury, who was kind of an Elvis kind of look-alike kind of mm -hmm. musician. And these uh, four kids from Liverpool called Johnny and the Moondogs. And Alan and I won that night. We sang, uh, we were just two 15-year-olds with, you know, 17-year-olds with acoustic guitars. We did It's Only Make Believe by Conway Twitty, and we won. But I, I think the Beatles, or Johnny and the Moondogs, as they were then, would have won, except that they had to catch the last bus home to Liverpool. <laughs> and they couldn't wait till the end of the show to see if they won. They may, they may have won, but it was me and Clarkie that won. That's a crazy story. <laughs> now, you've, you've been called the uh, rock and roll zealot. You've, been, you've done so many shows. You've played with so many different people. It, is there somebody um, that you wish you'd played with, that, that you wish you could have jammed with, didn't have the chance? I've thought about this occasionally, and obviously, you know, I, in my own personal opinion, uh, Bob Dylan is, is the poet majestic of America, and I can't wait for him to get the Nobel uh, Prize for Literature. Um, but I've always had this crazy uh, feeling that I'd love to sing uh, Yesterday with just Paul and his acoustic guitar. I think that might be an interesting musical moment. You know, he's coming to the Meadowlands in is August. Really? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Hello, Paul. <laughs> Could Graham Nash perhaps be a special guest at one of his shows in his upcoming tour? Hey, from your mouth to God's ear, as they say. <laughs> but how would that work? Would you? Would your people call his people, or? No, I would probably call Paul. Just call him up. Yeah. I mean, you guys did hang out together, right? Just a little, yeah. yeah. He was uh, he was very kind to me, Paul. He called me one Sunday morning, you know, and said, "Hey, uh, you know, we're doing this show down at Abbey Road." for 400 million people, which was the first Telstar satellite broadcast of All You Need Is Love. And uh, would I like to go down, you know? I mean, he's been very kind to me over the years, you know? A nice man. Did you whistle at the end of that record? Uh, I did, as a matter of fact. Can, and you, I, can I, you hear I, it on the I, record? I can. I can, You yeah. can. Oh, yeah. Other people are too busy trying to pick up the Paul is Dead well, clues to listen for that, really, I suppose. Really. <laughs> it was a great moment, though, really. Graham Nash, the album, again, everybody, This Path Tonight album, 
you know what era I come from. Um, and you can stream it too, right? Yes. Okay. And it comes out in vinyl and Blu-ray and, you know, DVD. Of, Perfect. You know, it's a lot of stuff in there. Perfect. And Wild Tales and paperback and audio book, which I highly recommend to hear this man's, this man's voice, which we've been able to hear for 22 minutes today. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Pleasure. You're very welcome. Thank you, everybody.